Hello and welcome to Principles of Mathematics lesson number 20. In our last six lessons of the term, we're going to be looking at decimals and percents. Uh, in this section, we'll start with terminating decimals. Um, we'll be looking at decimal notation, connections between fractions and decimals uh, using various models and strategies why terminating decimals occur and how to tell if a decimal will terminate and finally we'll look at ordering of terminating decimals the word uh, de decimal comes from the latin decim which means 10. Uh, the decimal number system has a base of 10. we are now familiar with uh, various number bases and uh, the decimal number system, of course, uses a base 10. Uh, we use, uh, that means basically that the digits that we use to form um, decimal numbers are from, uh, run from zero through nine. And that's how uh, we understood it to be when we studied various bases as well. For example, we can represent this decimal number 12.61873 as follows. Uh, we know that the 2 is going to be the 0th power of 10 place, that 1 is going to be the 10 to the 1 place, and then these are going to be the negative powers of 10. So 10 to the negative 1, 10 to the negative 2, 10 to the negative 3, 10 to the negative 4, 10 to the negative 5. So notice that um, the place values will be similar to this. So 10 to the power of zero that's going to be the ones place 10 to the power of one that'll be the tens place 10 squared for instance will be the hundredth place and so forth and then after the decimal we get the negative powers of 10 like 10 to the power of negative one now we know that x to the power of negative n equals one over x to the n so therefore 10 to the power of negative one is none other than one over 10 to the one, which is just 10. 10 to the power of negative two will be one over 10 squared, which is just one over 100, etc. right? 10 to the negative three would be one over 10 cubed, which is one over a thousand, for instance, right? And on so forth. Now, um, so here, that's going to be the one tenths place. We just say tenths with the THS at the end. And then we have 10 to the negative two place, which is one over 100, as we saw on the left here. 10 to the negative three, that would be the one over a thousand or the thousandths place. Uh, so here we can see we have Two, uh, well, one will be, this is the zero, 10 to the zero place and this is the 10 to the one place. So it'll be one times 10 to the one plus two times 10 to the zero, which is just one, if you recall. Um, and then plus six times 10 to the negative one, which becomes six times 10 to the negative one is basically the same as six over 10 to the one. So that's where we get the six tenth and then plus one times 10 to the negative two we know that's 1 over 100, so that's 1 over 100, plus 8 times these characters here, 10 to the negative 3, which is 1 over 1,000, so 8 over 10 cubed, or 8 over 1,000, right? Plus 4 over 10,000, plus 3 over 100,000. Now, the correct way to read this, of course, is 12 and, so where the decimal comes in, that's the only place you say and. Uh, six uh, you have to now just read this what would be what would be this this be read as if you were just looking at a whole number it would be 61,843 right so you start with that and then you have to basically do the following it's very simple if you approach this uh, approach it this way count the number of digits one two three four five so we're going to have as our denominator uh, 
a one and five zeros. Now, how do you read that? Well, that's a hundred thousand, right? So that's why you say sixty one thousand eight hundred forty three hundred thousandths. Notice with the THS at the end. Notice you do not say and here. The only place you say and is right when the decimal comes in, right? So 12 and that means the, th that's going to be uh, everything following that and is going to be the, um, the part that comes after the decimal point. So that's the correct way of uh, reading decimals. So think for a minute how you would read uh, what I'm about to write properly. All right, so the whole number part is easy. That's 342. Then you would say and, and of course, read this just as you see it, 12, and you're going to have over a one and one, two, three zeros, right? So you would say 342 and 12 thousandths. That would be the correct way of reading that, right? So we name each place of a uh, decimal uh, by uh, the power of 10 associated with it. So eight here would be the ones place. That's the two is the tens place. One here is the hundreds place. And after the decimal, we know that we get the THS at the end, right? So this is the tenths place, right? This is the hundreds place. So uh, the ones place tells you how many ones there are in this number. The tens place tells you how many tens there are in this number. The hundreds place, of course, tells you how many hundreds there are in this number. For the tens place, that tells you how many of these one tenths you have. And for the hundreds, it's telling you how many of those uh, items you have, the hundreds, right? All right, if you want to represent uh, decimals uh, using the concrete model of base 10 blocks, then how you begin your work depends on how many digits you have after the decimal point. So here we only have one digit, right, after the decimal point. So we only need to deal with tenths, right? So all we gotta do here is take our longs that we would normally consider to be uh, uh, 10 uh, units, and consider each of them as just one unit then one cube is going to be what one tenth of one of those so cubes will be representing one tenth right and of course here we're going to have five of these um, longs to represent the five um, units and four of these cubes representing tenths right so four tenths so notice that we have a total of 54 cubes right which can be thought of as 54 tenths which is the same as 54 over 10. that's how we also can see that 5.4 is the same as 54 over 10. so a very nice visual way of uh, thinking about decimals so if our decimal number that we want to represent using base 10 blocks has three digits after uh, the decimal uh, point. Of course, uh, we don't count, you know, uh, ending zeros. So they have to be three uh, digits where uh, the last one is not a, a zero, right? So then notice that we would want to break up. Uh, we want our unit to contain a thousand uh, uh, units in it, right? So this is now going to play the role of our ones, these cubes. Now, notice that each of these uh, uh, blocks here is uh, made up of 10 flats, right? So one flat would be one tenth of that uh, block, right? So the flats here, so the blocks will represent one unit, the flats will represent our tenths here, right? And notice that uh, each of these blocks will contain 
a hundred of the longs now, right? So uh, we, because there's 10 in each flat times 10, that gives us a hundred uh, of uh, these longs within one of these blocks. So these will represent the hundreds, etc. And uh, of course, we know that each of these blocks contains a thousand of these sim single cubes. So the single cubes now represent the thousands. Okay, so this is how we know we have two units and uh, uh, two tenths uh, of a unit uh, units and three hundredths units and uh, five thousandths units. Okay, so that's how you would want to represent a, a number like that. Of course, as we add digits to uh, pass the decimal, we would have to enlarge the size of our original unit. Every time we add one more, we have to enlarge our original unit by a factor of 10, right? So uh, if we had one more decimal place, our unit wouldn't just be this um, uh, 10 by 10, it would have to be what? Uh, you would have to multiply that by the power of 10. So instead of a thousand units, you would have to have what? 10,000 units, so you would need 100 by 100 cubes. So, and you see how it gets pretty hard to visualize at this point using uh, actual physical blocks, right? Uh, or to actually, what I mean, present physically, right? So that's why when we do these discussions for students, we usually basically uh, wrap it up with uh, three places. But notice there is no reason that this model can't keep going, right? So. But because of the limitations of creating these physical objects, we usually just suffice it to uh, stay with uh, this kind of a figure here. All right. I want us to go ahead and watch a short uh, video on YouTube to really uh, get a second exposure of what I just said and to uh, get a better grasp of this. So here we go. A short video by Mr. W. We're going to use base 10 blocks to represent decimals. You're used to calling this block a thousand block, but for decimals, we're going to call this a one block. This is, represents one whole. How many of these flats does it take to make one of these blocks? It takes 10, so we're going to call this a tenth because it takes 10 of them. How many of these rods does it take to make up our one block? Well, it would take a hundred of them and so therefore we call this a hundredth. And how many of these little tiny cubes does it take to make up our ones block? Well, it takes a thousand of them, so we call this a thousandth block. So here are our base 10 blocks. You can see that the large cube is the one block. As a decimal, it's represented as one or 1.0. The flat is a tenth block because it takes 10 of them to make the one block. And as a decimal, you can write it as 0 0.1. The rod is a hundredth because it takes a hundred of those rods to make up the big cube. And you could represent it as 0 0.01. And the tiny little cube represents a thousandth because it takes a thousand of them to make up the full big block. And as a decimal, you can represent it as 0 0.001. I want you to see if you notice a connection here with our decimal and our fraction. Look at a tenth. Doesn't it kind of look like the number 10 backwards if you ignore the decimal point? Look at the hundredth block. Or the hundredth. Doesn't it look like the number 100 backwards if you ignore the decimal? And how about the thousandth? Doesn't that look like the number thousand backwards if you remove the decimal? Okay, now I've got my place value chart down here below. And let's look at an example. So some people might call this number down here below as 1.234. But the correct way to read this number, the correct mathematical way, 
is 1 and 234 thousandths. Do you notice that the number, the word and is used to represent the decimal? That's the only time when it's okay to use the word and is when it's representing the decimal. Here is expanded form. So that's another way to show that number. Here is what it would actually look like in base 10 blocks. So we have one ones, two tenths, three hundredths, and four thousandths. All right, so a nice video to uh, reiterate what we just went over. Okay, so here we're going to convert each of these uh, fractions to decimals. And um, notice that uh, the first number, 25 over 10, has a uh, whole number in it because it's an improper fraction, right? So what we'll do is we can break this up as 20 over 10 plus 5 over 10. That's just, you know, the definition of addition of fractions with like denominators in reverse, right? So notice that the 20 over 10 is where I get the 2, and the 5 over 10 can be written as 5 times 110, right? So we have 2 and 5 tenths, which we, of course we know we write as such, so 2.5. So for 56 over 100, we realize that's just, there is no, this is a proper fraction, so there are no holes to worry about. So this is just 56 times 100, right? As we know that, that can be written as 0 0.56. Uh, same with this one, that's a proper fraction. So the easy way to figure out uh, how many uh, zeros, etc., you're going to need is to start on the right side with 5, 0, 2, like that, from right to left. And notice you're going to want to have as many digits past the decimal point as you have zeros in the power of 10 that's being divided uh, by uh, the 205 is being divided by here. So we notice that that's one, two, three digits. So I'm going to need one more digit, right? That's how you convert those. Now, this is, of course, just to gain an intuitive understanding of what's going on here. The fact of the matter is that once we master that understanding, we can come up with a very nice, quick algorithm to handle this. So basically, to divide any uh, number, whether it's whole or decimal, makes no difference. By a power of 10, you're basically going to take the decimal place of the original number and move it to the left by as many places as there are zeros in the power of 10, right? So for example, two point, when I see 25 over 10, using that algorithm, I say to myself, okay, for 25, the original decimal is right there. So I move it one to the left and it becomes what? 2.5. With 56 over 100, right? I know that I start with 56. I know the original decimal is right here past the 6 for 56. So if I move it 2 to the left, I get 1, 2. So it ends up right here. Now, this zero that we write before the decimal is really kind of optional. You don't have to write it, but it's nice if you do. It makes it more clear. It tells you that there are no holes in this particular uh, number, right? This number doesn't contain any holes. All right, same here with 205 over uh, 10,000. Using our quick algorithm, we're going to basically write the 205 the original decimal is right here at after the five. So we're going to move it one, two, three, four, right? As many places as there are zeros in the power of 10 that's uh, in the denominator. So we know we're going to need one, one zero to make it four. And we end up with 0 0.0205. And then we put the zero on the other side of the decimal to indicate that again, this is a uh, proper faction that was con con converted with no holes in it, okay? And that's W-H-O-L-E, of course.
All right. All right, now we want to convert these uh, fractions, which are a little bit more complex, into uh, decimal numbers. We can uh, do that as long as the factorization in the denominator, once we have fully factored these in their prime factored form, contains no numbers other than 2 and 5. And uh, let's see, for example, what we can do with 7 over 2 to the 6 to quickly turn it into a decimal. So what we do is we realize that if we uh, multiply the 2 to the 6 by 5 to the 6, right? And of course, we can't just do it on the bottom. We have to do it on the top as well, right? We end up with... 7 times 5 to the 6 on the top, right? And notice on the bottom, because whenever you have x m to the power of n, that's equal to x to the n times, um, I, I, I didn't want to use m, and that doesn't quite fit there. Let's go with x y to the power of the n. That's x to the n, y to the n, right? So quantity x, y to the power of n is just x to the n, y to the n, right? So if I apply this rule backwards, right? So now I have 2 to the 6 times uh, 5 to the 6. I can bring them and write them as a product to the power of 6. So that will be 2 times 5 to the power of 6, correct? So now I'm going to go ahead and just multiply out the top using a calculator. Okay, so we have 7 times 5 to the power of 6 on the top, which is 109,375. And that's going to be divided by 10 to the 6. 10 to the 6, of course, is going to be a 1 and six zeros after it so that's basically just one million so now to convert that quickly we're just going to get we're going to start with one hundred and nine thousand three hundred and seventy five and we're going to move the decimal point from its original place which for any whole number is just after the one digit and move it six places to the left remember as many places as you have zeros in your power of 10 that's being divided by so one two three four five six so it comes exactly to the left of the one and then we put the zero in the ones place to indicate that there are no holes in this uh, um, decimal number and of course that makes sense because this is a proper fraction with the numerator being strictly less than the denominator. All right, that's how you do that. Okay, uh, definitely, as always, goes without saying, try before you watch, right? Try it on your own before you watch. That way you get your mind really engaged into the learning process. All right, so what about for this one? If we're gonna use a similar trick to be able to write something like that down here, notice that, um, we're close to being able to do that. What's the only thing I would need to do to get there? Now, if this were 2 to the 4 times 5 to the 4, I'd be able to use a similar trick, right? But it's 2 cubed. So what do I need to multiply by to make that 2 to the 4? I think I heard you say it multiply by 2, right? I agree, because that's like 2 to the 1, right? So we have to make sure we do that on both the numerator and denominator because we don't want to change the problem. We just want to change the way it looks, right? So we're just multiplying by one. Perfectly legal operation, right? So we get, now we get two on the top and down below we now have two to the four times five to the four. As we saw in the previous uh, example, we can now say this is 2 over 2 times 5 to the 4. So it's 2 over, now notice that's 10 to the power of 4. So that's a 1 and 4 zeros, right? Or 10,000. So 
How are we going to write 2 over 10,000 using a decimal number? Well, we're going to put the 2 here. We know the decimal initially is right there, so we're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4. As many places as there are zeros in the power of 10 that's being divided by. So I noticed that I ran out of digits right away, so I'm going to start putting zeros. So we get point zero 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 two all right which is two ten thousandths right all right now did you try the next two if you haven't already and then come back all right so these two we're going to approach in a very systematic way that becomes similar to these. We're going to find the prime factorization of each of those uh, denominators. So for 125, I know that uh, 2 doesn't go into it, 3 doesn't go into it because the sum is 8. 1 plus 2 plus 5 is 8. So we're going to go ahead and move on to 5. 125 divided by 5 is 25. I know that 5 goes in 25, into 25 5 times, and then finally 5 goes into 5 once. Now what I have on the left is the prime factorization of 125. So we get 1 over 5 cubed. Now, in order to be able to turn this into the denominator into a power of 10, I'm going to have to multiply by what? Think about it. Yes, you said it right. By, by 2 cubed, right? Because now, what do we get? We get... 2 cube on the top and we get 5 cube times 2 cube using this trick in reverse we end up with what 5 times 2 cube right so that's basically going to be 8 over now remember that's 10 cube so a 1 and 3 zeros or simply a thousand right so now to convert that into a decimal is very simple. We start with 8. We move the decimal 1, 2, 3 places to the left. So we're going to need two zeros. Then we put our decimal point and a zero before it to indicate that there are no holes in this um, decimal number. All right. So now you should definitely, if you didn't get this already, you should definitely be able to do this on your own. So make sure you try it on your own before you watch what I do next okay we'll use exactly the same approach we'll find the prime factorization of 250 so we know that 2 goes into 250 125 times 5 goes into it 25 times 5 goes into 25 um, 5 times and then 5 goes into 5 one time so there is the prime factorization of 250 on the left 2 times 5 cubed so we have 7 over 2 times 5 cubed, right? So now, what do I need to multiply the denominator by to get a nice 2 cubed times 5 cubed scenario, right? Notice we only need a 2 squared, right? So we'll do that to the top as well. So now we have... 7 times 4 on the top and we have 2 cubed times 5 cubed down below, right? So that's going to be 28 over, that's going to be the same as 2 times 5 cubed, right? So notice that's 28 over uh, 10 cubed, which is what? 10 cubed is a 1 and 3 zeros, right? Or a thousand. So we go ahead and start with 28. The decimal is to the right of 8. We move it as many places as we have zeros in this power of 10. So 1, 2, 3. So we end up with 0 0.028 and we put a 0 on the left to indicate the number of holes in the decimal. All right, that is it. That's how you do these conversions. So make sure you practice some. You know, you can always uh, check to see if you've done it correctly on a calculator. Just make a fraction of your own. But remember, this can only work. This trick only works when once you have the prime factored form, 
you have nothing but twos and fives in it, right? All right, let's move on. So now we state this general fact, decimals ca that can be written with only a finite number of places to the right, right of decimal point are called terminating decimals. That's a word that you need to be familiar with. So that just means uh, decimals like 3.567, boom. At some point it stops, right? It doesn't keep going. 2.05, etc. These are all what's called, what are called terminating decimals. A rational number a over b in simplest form can be written as a terminating decimal if and only if the prime factorization of the denominator contains no primes other than 2 or 5. We got a real good feel for why that is true because if it's anything other than that we're not going to be able to get that 10 to the power of something on the denominator, right? And therefore we won't be able to uh, terminate the decimal. All right. Okay, here we take a look at uh, some fractions and determine whether they can or cannot be written as terminating decimals. Here are some examples of decimals that can, because look at 7 over 16. All you need to look at is the denominator, right? If the only thing you want to uh, determine is whether the number can be written as a terminating decimal or not, you all you do is you Find the prime factorization of the denominator if the only factors in it are either 2 or 5 or both. Both are fine too. Then it is possible to write it as a terminating decimal as we have seen. Uh, so here's another one, 19 over 40. It can The prime factorization is 2 cubed times 5. So yes, it can certainly be written as a decimal with the tricks we just learned. Uh, 3 over 160, we look at the prime factorization of 160 that's 2 to the 5 times 5 so yes because the only factors in the prime factorization of the denominator are 2 and 5 yes it can be done however look at 11 over 18 you can see that it is not going to be possible to do that because the prime factorization of 18 is 2 times 3 squared so it has a factor other than a prime factor other than 2 and 5 in it. So this one you will not be able to write it as a terminating decimal. Let's look at what happens if you actually do that as a division. So if you go 11 divided by 18, notice this the calculator can't show that it goes on forever, but it does. So you, you get 0.6, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, etc. 1's forever, right? Now, here, if you look at the division of 11 by 18, notice you get 0.6 and then ones forever. Calculator can't show that because it's limited, but these ones do go on forever. Uh, here's another one, 5 over 26. Notice 26 factors as 2 times 13. There is a prime factor other than 2 or 5, so you, you expect that not to be able to be written as a terminating decimal either. And in fact, when you divide, you can see that it does not uh, end, okay? And um, even though we may not see it right away, this does have a repeating pattern. If you look at a few more digits, you would see that. In fact, the, the repeating pattern starts right there. It's 230769. Here you see 238. That's because the calculator rounded. If it hadn't rounded, the what comes after the zero would have been a seven. So because it, the digit to the right of seven is a six, once it repeats, uh, it's going to round up and uh, give you two, three, oh, eight. Otherwise, this is, a, a as we will find out, a repeating decimal. Let's look at nine over 84. 84 can be factored as two squared times three times seven using the factorization method that we know. And therefore, again, factors other than uh, 5 or 2. So this would not be possible to write as a terminating decimal either. Of course, you can write it as a decimal, just not one that terminates, okay? Of course, we can uh, represent uh, terminating decimals uh, very nicely on a number line because of the fact that we know that uh, it can be represented as a rational number a over b where b is not zero and in fact it's a power of 10. So depending on 
the power of 10, you would break the uh, distance between 0 and 1 into that many parts. Uh, so for example, here we're looking at 0.56, which we know is 56 over 100, right? So we would know that we would want to break up the distance between 0 and 1 into 100 equal parts. Then we start counting at 0, and once we get to the 56th of those hundreds pieces, we have arrived at 0.56. Of course, if you were dealing with uh, something over a thousand, then you would want to break the distance between zero and one into a thousand equal pieces, etc. It's tedious, but it can be done. We notice that um, 56 over 100 can be seen to be between 50 over 100 and 60 over 100. So it's somewhere between 0.5 and 0.6 right notice that 5 over 10 is just 0.5 and 6 over 10 is just 0.6 so that makes sense as well right all right the process of comparing two terminating decimals is really simple you just have to be very careful in how you write them so let's say you have these two numbers and you want to compare them right what you do to see which one is larger so what you do is you write them precisely uh, with the right places under one another and you start looking from left to right in other from in other words from the highest place value to the lowest ones right and as long as they're equal you just put a check and you go on you go on the moment you hit a column where one of the two numbers has a larger digit you have located the larger number so you may be thinking, well, what about the rest of them? Look, this one is larger. The, the, prob the, the point is that this, is, this place value is 10 times larger than that place value and 100 times larger than that place value. So these aren't going to be enough to make a difference to make this bottom one larger than that, even if this one ended with nines forever, right? this is still going to be the larger decimal all right so this is probably one of our shorter videos because that does bring us to the end of the lesson proper now as as, as is our tradition we'll look at some uh, homework problems together all right here's a good problem which um, helps us understand some of the concepts we just learned 26 minutes is part of an hour if 26 minutes were to be expressed as a decimal part of an hour, explain whether it would be a terminating decimal. Of course, you know that if we want to write 26 minutes as the decimal part of an hour, we would take 26 minutes and divided by, we don't want to write one hour, so we want the minute equivalent, which would be what? 60 minutes right notice the units cancel out we're going to get a pure ratio right so question is can this be written as a uh, decimal number uh, which is uh, terminating now I could go ahead and just look at the prime factorization of 60 right but I always want you to aim for efficiency if possible I notice this is reducible right so I'm going to go ahead and reduce it. 2 goes into 26 13 times, and it goes into 60 30 times. So that's the same as 13 over 30. So all I need to look at is the 30, right? So I'm going to find the prime factorization of 30. I get 2, 15, 3, 5, 5, 1. So I notice that the denominator is going to be written as 2 times 3 times 5, right? Notice there is a factor here other than 2 or 5 in the prime factorization. Therefore, the answer would be we cannot write uh, the fractional, the, the part of an hour which 26 is in terms of a terminating decimal. All right, here's another interesting problem. We want to show that between any two terminating decimals, there is another terminating decimals, right? So in, in you know, the kind of answers they're going to want to give, they, they use the example of 0.1 and 0.2. Now, 
the easiest way to show this is that start with your uh, you have point 0.1 and point 0.2 right now they're very close on the number line right in it depending on the scale you use of course you know but with most ordinary scales they would be considered to be quite close right so um, all you have to do to find the decimal between them is find the average or the midpoint of those two points on the number line right so you would just take uh, point 0.1 add it to point 0.2 and divide by 2. All right, so now we go ahead and just calculate that. Okay, so I'm going to use parentheses, which is always a good idea when your numerator has more than one term in it. Just go ahead and put those in parentheses. So point 0.1 plus point 0.2. Notice I'm not typing the zeros because they're optional really and I, why should I take the time to put them in when I don't need them right uh, divided by 2 and we hit enter so we get 0.15 all right so we just found one decimal between 0.1 and 0.2 now let me actually write these with a little bit more of a distance to so I'm going to make this scale uh, somewhat different. All right. So notice that here I've just found the number exactly in the middle, 0.15. So what if I wanted to get another decimal uh, between those two? Can I? Yeah, of course. I mean, if I want another decimal between 0.1 and 0.2, an easy thing I could do is now find the midpoint of 0.1 and this 0.15, right? So I just have to go 0.1 plus 0.15 over 2. So again, we'll go ahead and calculate 0.1 plus 0.15 and we divide the result by 2. So what's what we consider to be the average of uh, two uh, decimal numbers is actually uh, geometrically speaking just the midpoint between uh, those two numbers on the number line, right? So we get point zero point one two five. So now I found the number right here between these two. Now. Can I get another? Sure, just repeat the process. This is what's considered to be a recursive process because the output of one step becomes, becomes the input for the next step, right? So I just do the same thing with 0 0.1 and this 0.125, I get another one in the middle here and then another one in the middle here. Now, this process never needs to terminate, right? Because you're never actually gonna hit uh, zero. So therefore, this tells you what this tells you there are infinitely many decimals between any two decimal numbers no matter how close they are this tells you how dense the set of real numbers is right take any two real numbers you can you can expand this to the set of real numbers notice that in this same way using the same trick you can show that given any two real numbers, no matter how close they are, as long as they're different, right? You can fit infinitely many real numbers between those two real numbers. All right, the fascinating world of the real number line. All right, for this, I just wanna give you a hint, explain whether one day can be expressed as a terminating decimal part of a 365 the year of course you're going to be looking at the fraction 1 over 365 and to determine whether that can be written as a um, repeating uh, decimal or not and of course you know how to do that now right you're going to find the prime factorization of this and then see whether there are factors other than 2 or 5 in it or not then answer the question all right so here's a kind of a clever question can you look can you tell whether each of the following is incorrect by just looking at each of them. Well, how do we know 1 fifth equals 2 is an incorrect statement? Well, think about it. This is a, this is an 
uh, proper fraction, right, with the numerator less than the denominator. So because it's positive, we know this is going to be some number between 0 and 1, right? So therefore, it can't possibly be what? 2. How about this one? 2 thirds equals 0. 0.6. This is actually a test of whether you understood what we said about what kinds of fractions can turn into terminating decimals. What's the denominator here? 3. What's the prime factorization? Just 3, right? So that means the prime factorization has a number other than 2 or what? 5 in it. Therefore, this can't possibly be written as a terminating decimal such as 0.6 and that's that. All right, let's see if we can help D'Angelo here because D'Angelo sees a symmetry in the decimal place value charts and Wonder is why there is no once with the THS place in the end uh, um, uh, uh, place. So uh, basically, what you would have to explain to D'Angelo is that if there were, because look at uh, what would happen if there were a once. That would that would mean it would be a one over one, right? But we already have a place for that, which is what the ones place. All right. Okay, let's look at one last problem before we call it the day. Students in a seventh grade classroom were asked what number is halfway between 1.3 and 1.4. Here are three common responses. 1.3 and a half, 1.3.5, and 1.35. Uh, which uh, one of these would you consider to be um, a misconception? How would you explain it? Well, notice that this obviously... Uh, shows a confusion about what a fraction is. Uh, this one shows a confusion about how a decimal point should be used. Uh, how about this one? Is that uh, any kind of a confusion? But let's see. What is the number halfway between 1.3 and 1.4? You would basically have to take 1.3, add it to 1.4, and divide it by 2, right? It's the average of the two numbers. So if you were to actually do that, so we would go 1.3 parentheses, of course, 1.3 plus 1.4, and we would go ahead and divide that by 2, and we get exactly 1.35. So the students who came up with that particular response uh, actually had gotten a good grasp of the concept okay all right so um, that should do it for this video take care of yourself we'll see you for the next one